Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. It is always a special pleasure when we have an alum joining us and tonight uh, we have uh, Robin Lee as uh, our guest speaker. Robin is a beauty and fashion photographer based in New York. Before coming to the city, he attended the University of Toronto, where he graduated with a degree in visual studies and fine art history. Um, this is a background that has served him well. Um, it gives him a strong foundation in color and composition. His images have earned him recognition from the Adobe Design Achievement Awards, the APA Awards, and the IPA Professional Advertising Awards. Robin's photographs regularly grace the pages of top fashion publications around the world, including Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, Marie Claire Allure, Glamour, Elle, Cosmopolitan L'Officiel. So please help me welcome Robin Lee to our lecture series. Um, I was born in China and then immigrated to Canada when I was 16. And growing up, um, I was very shy and quiet, and I guess I I still am right now, <laughs> so a little bit nervous right now, so yeah, just bear with me. Um, so since I was a kid, I like to kind of observe the world around me quietly, so I really always kind of into art making, and then uh, I felt like art really allowed me to, you know, translate my observation into words and then really help me express my feelings and emotions. So I remember I would always, you know, just sit, my, sit in my room and then making those little drawings or sketches. So they kind of act like my little diary in a sense. Um, so because of my passion in art, uh, I gone through many art classes like drawing, paintings. So you name it, I took it all. So it was natural to me that I chose something art related when I go to university. Okay. So when I thought about um, what I want to, you know, study in university, uh, I wanted to study something like uh, I want to do something different from other people's. Uh, back in the days, like most of my friends would choose something like, you know, economics or business. And then I see a lot of Asian here tonight. Hi guys. <laughs> and then you might, re yeah. <laughs> okay. So you might, you know, relate or not. And back in my days, uh, a lot of, you know, Asian parents are, you know more uh, are still prefer their kids to you know uh, study something like uh, commerce or science so which will eventually lead to a more stable job you know such as banker or doctor or you know um, a lawyer or something like that uh, I was first studying uh, architecture actually when I first got into University of Toronto and uh, I think uh, being, an being an architect is more kind of acceptable for my family than being an artist. So, um, it's so. However, like when I first study like um, history of modern art, I was really drawn to like all the art movements and avant-garde artists, and then you know their manifesto and whatnot. So I decided to transfer from architecture to visual study and uh, fine art history, and my decision, you know. Uh, by you know studying art really just got my parents really worried and then they would worry about like how are you going to make a living if you become an artist it's so hard you know just by you know making art so what are you going to do and then but you know uh, at that time like I didn't really know like what I will be doing you know in the future but I know like I wanted to do something in the art field and then um, long story short um, I kind of gained like a strong uh, art foundation through you know four years in university and art learning um, and then through those four years we kind of studied like you know experimented with different art mediums such as you know installation paintings and drawings printmaking even like performance art so it was kind of fun and then to get to try you know different kinds of art mediums but because all of those you know exposures in art I kind of felt really overwhelmed and then lost somehow. And um, not until my uh, senior year in university, I uh, you know, gradually realized that most of my work that I was very passionate about was done by photography. And that's when uh, I know that you know, photography is my thing and then that's something that I really want to do. Um, yeah, so 
upon like graduation, right? So I was puzzled as most of the graduates were, um, like where's the future leads? So do I find a job or should I continue to study? And then, I mean, there's definitely no right or wrong answer here, um, but, but back, you know, back then, in my mind, I just know I didn't want to stay just in, at Toronto and then find a regular nine to five job. So, uh, because I stayed in Toronto for quite some while, it's like almost 10 years, and then I really just wanted to get out of there and then live in a new environment. And then looking back, you know, through all of the art learning experiences, I felt that nobody kind of really told me why to make art, and it's always like how to make art. And then I felt that I never had anything to, you know, to say or the reason to do what I did. So it's always just, you know, completing assignments and then in order to get my degrees, I guess. So um, at that moment, I kind of felt the need to learn more about, you know, photography and art, and that's why. I decided to, you know, pursue po like graduate study here at SVA, and to kind of challenge myself to be a better photographer and artist. And then, even till this day, I think that's probably one of the best decision I ever made. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think you know this program is really great, and like you know. Um, combine, <laughs> you know, the technical part and the business side of the program really just prepared me for, you know, the professional field. And then, yeah, a little bit, you know, a shameless plug here. So I would highly suggest everyone, you know, who's interested in photography and then take this class. Yeah, it could be a life-changing choice. And at least it was for me. So uh, the beginning, yes. Um, so when people ask me how I got into fashion photography, um, I guess the answer was pretty simple. It's, it's just like I simply wanted to make a living. And so I did some research and then talking, I, I talked with some of my artist friends and then I realized like, you know, it's really hard to do just fine art and to make a living. So I felt that fashion photography, it's the perfect combination of art and commerce. and I can still make art in some sense and then still be able to pay my bills. And so, a plus, not to mention that I really do like fashion. I mean, you kind of need to love fashion in order to you know, do fashion photography, in my opinion. So, um, since I had no prior knowledge of fashion photography whatsoever, so I think the best way to, you know, to learn is to, you know, through assisting, right? And then, uh, during that time, I assist some f uh, fashion photographers, and then through assisting, uh, I learned some, you know, the basic of how, you know, being a fashion photographer, like how to reach out to model agencies, how to write a call sheet, and then, um, you know, how to find your team, and uh, just the whole, you know, production process, I guess. Um, I think if you are just trying to learn the technical part of photography by, you know, assisting, such as like you know how to set up a light or something I think you're really missing the point here I think you know the true like the importance of assisting for me is to really build relationship with you know people other people on set and then just really learn how does the industry work and then I think those connection you made during those times will eventually kind of you know reconnect later on and then um, so uh, also, I think uh, because I have no prior knowledge to fashion photography, right? So I took the advantage of my thesis project. So I, you know, I try to incorporate fashion photography into my thesis project and really just give it a go and then see if I really like, you know, fashion photography and that's is something that I really want to do. So here's my thesis project, and some of you might have seen it in the hallway. I'm, I'm not sure if it's still there, but I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, not that bad, sorry. Yeah, I've probably seen it before. Um, what was your thesis project about? It's about flower and fashion. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> yeah, so um, I guess uh, 
yeah, so one year was just really short, right? So I was at you know the same place a year ago before, so I was thinking about what's going, what's next, right? Um, but this time I was so determined that I wanted to be a fashion photographer, and uh, um, and New York is definitely the right place to be. So since it's the capital city of fashion, so but in reality, you mean I mean, it's as a foreigner, right? So you need to get a work visa in order to work here legally. And then, you know, I talked, I did some research and then consulted with a lawyer and I was not ready for my O-1 visa back yet. So I still need to kind of build up my portfolio and then wait for the right time to apply. Um, plus, not to mention that living in New York, it's, you know, just the living expense is crazy. So I wouldn't be able to afford to live here back then. So I decided to go back to Toronto. But uh, here I want to, Thanks to you know one of my friends Yulia Gorbachenko, who I assisted before, and then who was also my thesis advisor, and then you know this this industry can be really competitive sometimes. So it was so great that she's so generous for giving me all the you know tips and advice and just guiding me through all the process, you know, um, before like at the beginning of my career. So. And then she's also the one like really inspired me to start with beauty photography, and which I'll talk about very soon. And uh, yeah, so uh, I just, so uh, during my two years, I went back to Toronto. And then during my two years in Toronto, all I can think of was you know just getting my visa and then come back to New York, and uh, that was top my top priority. So at the same time, um, I just never stopped shooting. I would organize like three to four shoots and then per week just to get myself busy and then just to you know learn as much as you can and uh, although like looking back some of the work I did in Toronto may not really reflect my current aesthetics but because all of the experimentation I did all of the all of the shootings I did it really kind of helped me become a better photographer I guess yeah. and then here are some of the work I did in Toronto. So they're all really old work. Yeah, so as you can probably see, like all of these are just, you know, beauty images. Like I said before, I started shooting beauty first because to me that was the easiest option. So you only need like a makeup artist, a uh, hairstylist and a model and then you're good to go. And back in Toronto, like you can even find like an artist who can do both hair and makeup, which can make your life so much easier. And uh, why not shoot fashion then? Um, I mean, fashion is great. So, but when you are just starting out, it's so hard for you to find a good stylist or good styling. And you know, for a fashion story, styling is really, really important. And uh, uh, you might not be able to find a magazine would give you a pull letter for you to borrow clothes to you know shoot the story, or unless you are like rich or have a huge credit card, you can do like buy and return, and which some of my friends actually did. And but it's only a short, short. It's it's a short term thing, right? So it's not the right thing to go. And. Um, I mean, when there's styling involved, things can get really complicated. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's just, you know, like I said, when you're starting out, it's really important that you get good, it's, it's really important to get good styling. And then for some bigger magazines, like in general, they have really specific requirements on, you know, styling too. So they would ask, you know, um, they want to feature like certain designers and for this you know specific season so it's really hard for you to get those things and then if the styling is not right i mean it will be a total waste of everyone's time and you know money so just why not bother right so i mean that's why i stick to beauty photography and then also i felt that you know with beauty stories i have more control over the final result and then you can find like a you know makeup reference that you really like and then send it to a makeup artist and then just shoot it shoot it however you like and when you're on set you only need to worry about you know the hair or the makeup i think it's much easier for you to manage in the beginning right um 
And another good thing about shooting beauty is that it kind of trained your eyes, pay more attention in details, and you started to notice like little things that you wouldn't notice before. Um, yeah, so I guess you just learn as you go. As I'm shooting like so much, and my beauty work started to get people notice me and my work, and it really kind of boosted my confidence in photography. And then artists in Toronto started to reaching out to me and saying, you know, let's collaborate on this or that. And then I started to work for you know better publication and then better model as well. And uh, during the last half year. In Toronto, so I was getting my visa soon. I know I was getting my visa soon, so I just, you know, completely shift my focus in New York. So I would, you know, started to traveling back and forth. I remember I would take like a, you know, a f night bus on a Friday and then just come here for the weekend just to shoot and then go back to Toronto on Monday. I know it was really tiring, but you know, it, it was totally worth it. I was just, you know, reaching out to artists who are based in here and then asking them if we can, you know, do a project together and then I will reach out to model agency and artist agency to really just build my relationship here. I just don't want to come to New York as a blank paper, I guess. Um, I'm, the, I'm just trying to prepare myself for like the new future. And uh, now, uh, yeah, I'll talk about both of my editorial and commercial experiences, I guess. Um, I think whether you are shooting for a magazine or doing an editorial job, I mean, a commercial job, it is the same that you kind of just molding yourself to meet different demands. It's kind of like, you know, problem solving process. It can be very hard uh, and challenging in my opinion, but it is the same in every job. Like if you don't enjoy the process, you know, of the problem solving process, then you might feel, you know, discouraged or defeated or even sometimes wanted to give up. Um, but I think you need to be always on your A game and then cautious about everything around you. And uh, I slowly realized that um, you know fashion photography is really just um, part of the fashion trend. And then we as the fashion photographer are just you know there to capture the moment. So uh, I think the importance here is that I think we need to know like what is up and coming at the moment and to really know the taste and the preference of the fashion industry. And I guess um, all I'm saying is that you need to be on trend and then you need to know who is who and what is what. And I mean, and you also need to kind of keep your eyes fresh and then your minds open. And we are in New York, right? So you can find new inspiration or opportunities everywhere every day so I would suggest you guys to you know in your spare time to go you know watch a movie or go to galleries see a Broadway show or just check out the new shop that just pop up in Soho so the more you know the better you prepared for you know the future work ahead of you and um, another thing is that you have to know this industry is not a one-man show so it's all about you know teamwork and collaboration so, uh, speaking of collaboration, I want to talk more about the importance of it. So, collaboration is about you know having a vision and letting it develop uh, collectively through your team. Um, it's important to kind of open your mind and then listen to everyone's opinions and but not being afraid to take you know to take the lead or responsibility when you have to. And uh, for me, I think a successful team is one that you know everyone can work tightly together and then can challenge each other sometimes but when you guys are in a you know stressful situation you know each one can you know also support each other too and then i found that it's really kind of powerful you know working with different creative mind in this industry and it's so rare to find that connection where you know when you don't have to say much but everyone just kind of know what you want and then be on the same page and uh, as some of you may know I have a business partner which is my girlfriend and then uh, we you know we work together we live together you know 24 7 and then she knows me really well like we know each other really well and then she's kind of like my producer and then manager at the same time so she's helping me 
like um, you know, replying emails, organizing shoot, and then dealing with the money part, uh, which I find is really important. I think for a photographer, like dealing with when you're starting out, you're on your own, right? Dealing with clients and then talking about the money, it's kind of awkward sometimes. So to have someone beside you and then just help you support you, so it's really great. I mean. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> yeah. So I'll tell you. Yeah, and I guess some of you might be interested to know, like, you know, how to shoot an editorial for a magazine. And then I'll show you some of my editorial work and then kind of guide you through my, you know, everyday process and my typical workflow when I'm shooting for a magazine. And uh, yeah, and this is the cover story I did for Vision China. So it was on location. Yeah, so I think everything just, you know, starting, everything started by just reaching out to the magazine. So first of all, I'm a huge fan of this magazine. Even back when I was still in China, I remember like, I would, you know, go to the bookstore after school and then just flip through all the pages and then just read through all the you know, stories. And then I even have a little mini collection of their past issue as well. So um, since I became a fashion photographer, I knew you know, I wanted to shoot for them someday. So thanks for social media, I was able to find the you know, fashion editor on Instagram. And I messaged her saying how much I love the magazine. And is there any chance I can do a story for you guys? And then uh, uh, here's a little tip. And I mean, just don't be afraid to reach out to the people you wanted to work with. And uh, uh, no matter how successful or you know, experienced they are, so you just never know. I mean, the worst case will be a no, and then you just keep on trying, and then you will be so surprised like how many people would actually reply. Uh, like, the other like the other day, I, I reached out to a stylist that I really wanted to work with, and. Uh, I didn't expect her to reply, but she actually did, and then we're actually planning a story really soon. So yeah, back to this. Uh, lucky me, like the editor kindly replied, and uh, she said like, "Oh, we love your work," and then we're actually planning for our next issue, and then the theme for that particular issue is Drifter. So normally, like magazine would give out like a theme or a concept of what they want to do, right? So sometimes it can be like very specific. Uh, for example, they can say like, "Hey, we want to do you know a monochromatic story, where we want to feature everything you know red from styling to m makeup." And sometimes can be you know the theme can be really simple, just like a word like this one, drifter. So after you got the theme or the concept, the next step will be like building a mood board. Um, so. And this one is the mood board I did for this story. So yeah, I think when you are doing like a building a mood board, right? So um, you can be really detailed or extensive about this, or can keep everything really simple, just like this one. I have included some, you know, the styling references. Uh, or the mood I was going for, and sometimes I even include like the location I want to shoot, and yeah, because you know the theme is drifter. So when I think about you know drifter, I think about them as you know a traveler. So I really wanted to just portray a sense of loneliness when we are on the go or when we are traveling. So that's why I decided to shoot at a you know a quiet remote motel in Long Island, and uh, which was really fun. And uh, I think after you have your initial mood board, I think it's time to yeah to find the perfect team. So I don't normally have like you know one team that I work with a lot, but I have like a different group of artists that I know I can work well together, and then I know their strength and skills. For example, like you know some makeup artists can do like those really artistic or. Uh, creative makeup, which can be really good for like editorial job, and then some artists can, you know, it's good for like simple everyday, or glamorous makeup, which can be good for commercial clients or celebrity jobs. So, 
I think, you know, depending on the project, I would just choose them, you know, wisely and accordingly. And uh, yeah, and then after the mood board, I'll show, show it to my makeup and hair artists as well. And then I wanted to see like what their thoughts on, you know, the makeup or the hair they want to do. And just like I said, it's, a, it's all about teamwork, right? So it's important to know like what's everyone's idea, like everyone's idea on this. And then it's really important for me that everyone who's involved in this project like really truly believes in that. And then everyone respect each other's opinion and then use each other's skills to, you know, create something good in the end. And uh, after you got your team and then you uh, have your mood board set, I think it's time to, and then of course you have to send it to the editor for approval. After that, um, it's time for, you know, finding the perfect model. I think it's really important to find the right model. Like in my opinion, like a good model and the right model can really help you to elevate a story. And often when I shoot for editorial, I like to work with model who are, you know, trending right now or have a higher status or uh, profile. What I mean by that is, you know, um, a model often have like a certain ranking on this <laughs> A website called models.com so on this website you know this model can have like a title of you know top 50 or hot list or industry icon for example so I think it's a good website to you know check regularly and to see what is going on in the industry and then which model is doing well and it's in hot demand so by shooting those type of models and not only you know you let the industry you let the people in the industry know like you are in the game and you know the trend and then these models can also kind of help you gain some exposure as well so that could be a win-win situation and plus when they are you know have that kind of status you know they are really good models and then they can deliver a really good performance and uh, I'm not saying that you like you really need to you know work like with these high profile models all the time I mean the importance thing here is to you know find the right models who are good fit for this project and then the model who can really inspire you to create something great so I know it's difficult to you know get some of those models when you're just starting out so I mean just don't get discouraged when your work gets better and better and you know it's easier to get those type of girls um, after you find your perfect model your team and then uh, it, I think the pre-production is pretty much done. So I think the more you're prepared, the better your pre-production is, the smoother on the date of the shoot. So the shoot actually went really well. In the end, I was able to get a lot of good images and then the magazine really loves the photos and they ended up using it as their cover story. So it was a really great surprise. You just never know. Um, yeah. So I'll show you some more of my publication work and then tell you more about my experiences. Um, and this is a fashion story I did uh, for Harper's Bazaar. And then we shot this in Upper East Side. And personally, I think um, you know, shooting on location is really great for uh, fashion editorial. The environment and the atmosphere really, you know, gives you a narrative for the story. So, you know, just ask your model to look around and then to get into a character. And uh, it's just really help everyone to get into the mood. And then for me personally, I think I felt more inspired when I was, you know, given a environment or a set when I'm doing like these kind of, you know, works. And then uh, shooting on location, it can be, you know, hard sometimes as well. So. You, you might need to worry about you know, the weather and then sometimes you need to go through a whole bunch of people and then spend a whole lot of money to get a permit. And, uh, and you might need to worry about you know, just random people bumping to your scene. So it's just yeah, really challenging. And, uh, but yeah, be prepared for, you know, to expect the unexpected and then always have a plan B when you are shooting on location. Um, and uh, this one is a story I did for 
iris cover book, and then it's also on location as well because of the theme is Japanese inspired. So we actually shot the story at a tatami suite in a hotel, which was a really fun day. <laughs> yeah, um, and this story is a cover story I did for one magazine, and. Uh, yeah, we shot this in a studio with natural light. And uh, as you can see, like even in a studio space, I would always wanted to create a sense of environment. So I would always ask a set designer to bring some, you know, props, like, you know, simple furniture or like flooring or curtains, whatever. So just to make, you know, the set more interesting. And uh, like I said before, the environment and the set really, you know, inspired the model to get into the mood and to get into the character. And uh, for me, I think what, uh, when you're shooting in studio for a fashion editorial or any kind of editorial, I think if the, you know, the styling or the models is not strong enough, so sometimes things can get really, you know, can, can go wrong really quick. And then the, you know, the, the story may end up looking like a lookbook or a catalog, which we don't really want for you know an editorial job. And uh, yeah, and this is another cover story I did for Bolivar magazine. And um, on the day, I brought some oranges on set. So as you can see, like you know, something as simple as an orange can make you know a story more interesting. And. Uh, and this one as well, um, I just use like a plain white cube and I ask the model to interact with it so you'll have more, you know, options to play with on set. And then, yeah. And uh, like this one too, I yeah, brought a chair and then put just, you know, put like a red gel in front of my lens just to make things more dynamic and interesting. And, uh, and this is a beauty story I did for Harper's Bazaar. So when you are shooting for beauty editorial, um, unlike you know doing fashion, you don't have a lot of pages to work with. Normally for like a typical fashion shoot, you'll have about eight to 10 or 10 to 12 pages. But for a beauty story, you only get to have you only got like maybe four to five pages to work with, which is really limited. And uh, for shooting like, you know, a beauty story, your job is to really showcase a makeup trend, like what's new in the beauty and makeup industry. So, uh, and then you only have the model's face to work with, which is really limited and challenging sometimes. So not only you need to capture like all the different makeup looks and then but you need to capture them you know in a different way to make you know the story interesting for the readers i mean you don't want to have like you know five pages with exact same face and then just different makeups which i found really boring and i guess that's my approach when i'm doing a beauty story and uh yeah, here's more beauty story I did for Harper's Bazaar. As you can see, like just try different angles or different positions. Going like macro sometimes, where even pull back, I you know do like a three quarter or you know yeah, just keep things interesting. Or yeah, use props too. Like I used veil here just to make things interesting. And this is one for Vogue Taiwan. Like I said, you know pull back and then we're going macro sometimes really helps to make the things more, you know, dynamic and interesting. And uh, yeah, when shooting an editorial, uh, I really don't like to, you know, limit myself in terms of, you know, lightings or angles. So I always trying new things. Um, sometimes I see something I really like or some photos I really like, I would ask the question like, you know, how did they like this? What did they use to create these photos? So not saying that you need to, you know, copy other people's work, but I think when you are just starting out, you know, it's a good way to learn by just mimicking other people's work. And then I think just, you know, uh, grab everything you learned and then apply it to your own practice will, you know, really help. And uh, for this story I did for WWD, and I 
experimented with tungsten light, so it kind of gives this, you know, retro vintage f feelings. And uh, for this one, I tried with, you know, spotlights, and I, I cut out some, you know, gobo shape to create this, you know, interesting shadow effect. And um, for this one, I experimented with LED light and then different color gels as well. So I guess what I'm trying to say is just don't limit yourself and, tr you know, try new things. And uh, I think you need to really just get out of your comfort zone. I, I remember, like, when I starting out, I would always use, like, my Profoto lights. That's the one I own, and that's the one I know how to use. So, but as... I experimented with, you know, different lightings, tri-natural light or hard light or continuous light. So the knowledge I gained, it's just also kind of really boost my confidence in my skills as well. So I think by mastering all, you know, different types of lightings will help you be more prepared for the future clients as well. And uh, yeah, trust me, I had experiences where, you know, a client would ask you to change your lighting on set, like to something totally different, and what are you going to do if you don't know how to light it, right? So you have to kind of, you know, adapt to the situation and then um, deliver the result the clients want. So, yeah, just don't limit yourself. And uh, I'll talk about test and creative. Yep. So I guess when you are starting out, um, you know, it's hard for you to get your work published. So I would suggest you to start with, you know, doing tests or creative. And you can always submit those tests or creatives to a magazine and then get them published. Um, a lot of people always ask me, like, you know, why are you still doing tests or creatives when, you're not, when you are not getting paid at all? So, I mean, it's pretty simple. Like, I just wanted to, you know, try new things and then to be creative. Like I said, when you are shooting for a magazine or doing a commercial job, your creative freedom is, you know, really limited. So by doing a test, I mean, just think of tasks as, you know, making an artwork or doing a personal project where you are the artist and then you are the, you know, you have the full control over everything. And uh, if I see something like, you know, I really, if, if I have something I really want to do, for example, like, um, uh, if I have a concept that I've been dying to do for so long and then or a lighting setup I really want to try for, you know, my next shoot, maybe I will always organize a test or creative to really, you know, just take the full advantage of it. And then um, I think it's not always about the money for me. I guess sometimes you might feeling like you're totally drained physically or mentally from all the works you have done. But I think for me, doing a test, it's kind of like taking a break and you are doing something that you really want to do. So I think it's really important for you to, you know, keep doing tasks, keep doing creatives. And some of the tasks I did, you know, ended up get published and uh, I even got booked because some of the clients really liked the task images I did. So, I mean, just, you know, keep doing tests. And, uh, yeah, on the side note, I actually have a syndication company helping me like license all of my images. And then that could be a, you know, a extra way to, you know, earn some money. And then they're also helping me kind of tracking down any possible infringement as well. So it's really complicated. I don't want to get into that. So it, it should be another story. Um, but, you know, pay attention for, you know, copyrights and stuff like that in class. And uh, yeah, it's really intense. Um, and here are some of the tasks I did. Um, and like this one, I experimented with you know a makeup concept I had in mind. And uh, or you can just simply you know doing some tasks and build up your book. Like this one is all about you know close up beauties, and natural things for the client to see your abilities, right? And this one is like you know experimenting with different light. And uh, yeah, you just never know. Like, like this story got published in the end, and this story even got published by you know Vogue Taiwan as well. So it's it was just a task before. So uh, now I'll talk about my commercial works. Uh, yeah. And uh, 
so yeah so as you can see like um, my commercial works is totally different comparing to my you know editorial work so depending on the clients you know some clients may have very specific like standards or needs and you know specific targeted consumers so that they wanted to you know approach so your creative freedom is really limited and sometimes you have none at all so you kind of have to find a balance to really you know uh, make your client happy and you happy as well and uh, at the end of the day you are booked to make your client happy and but sometimes you know there are other types of clients that really just appreciate your work and then they really want you to use your creativity to achieve their vision so you will have more freedoms and uh, I think they just you know looking for someone who can grow with them together so that would be my you know perfect scenario for art and commerce and uh, I think as you gain more experiences and then your work gets better I think eventually your work will you know, speak for itself, and then you will attract the right clients in the end. Uh, yeah, retouching. <laughs> so lastly, I want to talk about, you know, retouching. Uh, I think for me, retouching, it's, it's just like a tool, right? Its role is to kind of enhance the photo for a stronger visual impact. And many people think that, you know, retouching or Photoshop can do everything. I mean, yeah, sure, it, it can, but do we really need that desperately? I think that's probably my question. So if you ever say to yourself, like, you know, I'll fix that later in Photoshop, I think you probably, you know, stray too far and then relying too much on Photoshop. So uh, I think the truth is you need to, you know, start off by getting everything right in camera first. So as a, you know, have to kind of know your light and then learn your light and learn how to light your, you know, photos properly. And as a photo, I mean, as a photographer, uh, I think whether you are outsourcing your photos to a retoucher or you are doing the retouching on your own, I think you need to have some knowledge, like the basic on, you know, how does retouching work and uh, how does Photoshop work? Like, you know, learn the vocabularies, you know, like dodge and burn, you know, s frequency separation, curves and color grading, that kind of stuff. So those things will really help you, like when you are communicating with a, you know, retoucher, so they know exactly what you want. So, and the end result will be so much better. And for now, uh, most of my work were are retouched by me. So <laughs> I actually do kind of enjoy retouching. It's kind of like a little meditation for me. But of course, yeah, if I like the photo, it will be really enjoyable. But if I hate the photos or I find it tedious, it will be like total torture. So um, yeah, in my opinion, like as a good retoucher, especially, uh, you know, beauty retouching, funny enough, you kind of have to know like how to do makeup as well, in a sense. So, you know, have to know the basic on like how to do a smoky eye or uh, how to do like, you know, natural everyday makeup, <laughs> how to, yeah, contour and highlight. And uh, yeah, I think just think of, you know, retouching as doing makeup digitally. So in my spare time, I would just, you know, go onto YouTube, watch all the makeup tutorials, <laughs> You know, all the reviews and learn the tips and tricks and then apply those when I'm doing my own retouching. So yeah, I think yeah, YouTube can be your you know, best friend. Um, so to conclude everything I just said, um, I think some of the, my friends or family like kind of always envy about my job as a fashion photographer. So I think they always think that, wow, it's such a glamorous industry. You must surround it by, you know, famous people, A-list celebrities, or beautiful models, luxury brands. But yeah, but I mean, strip away all the glamours. It's a really like extremely competitive industry where you know creatives and strategists have to work together to keep up with the fast-changing trend and then you know those high-demanding consumers. Um, so there's a saying that in fashion, one day you're in, the next day you're out. Yeah, I mean, the pressure is really on in this industry, but I think the truth is uh, pressuring yourself 
like doesn't make you a better person at work. So I think you have to enjoy the process. If you don't enjoy the process of doing, you know, this, uh, you you just cannot move forward and then to achieve the things that you want to achieve. And uh, I think at the end of the day, it's just another job. We're talking about, you know, art and commerce, right? Um, making money by doing something you love. And uh, sometimes, you know, things can get, you know, really personal and ugly in this industry when your work's being, you know, altered or changed or criticized harshly. And people can say really mean things to you or, you know, look down on you, but uh, you just have to learn, like, you know, uh, to let go and then just keep moving forward. I think uh, in order for me to have, like, you know, a long, sustainable career, I really have to, I had to learn that how to detach myself from the work after it's done and then just keep forward and then, you know, because, you know, just looking forward to the next job and then keep a good balance. Um, and uh, lastly, I want to share my motto with you guys. Just start, the rest is easy. And uh, thank you guys for listening. Um, what was your first kind of a lucky break when your career jump started, your first great client, or how, you know, like some crucial moment in your career when mm -hmm everything changed that's the first question okay. uh, second is um, how do you get to shoot with for because I noticed these magazines are from like Kazakhstan like yes. but, uh, mm -hmm. Taiwan how do they, do they find you do you find them okay. how does that work yeah and are you agency represented and okay. if you're not I mean you mentioned the uh, um, syndication but yeah it's not artist agency yeah so but it's, it's would a different you kind of company. would you want to be and um. what what would be your dream agency Okay, I'll answer that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I guess for the first question is, what is my you know jumping point, right? So um, let me think. I think the first step is to for me is to come to New York because New York it's really just you know the opportunities just. There's so much more, and then it's like uh, I find that like in New York, um, companies or magazines are more likely to you know trust like you know upcoming photographers, and then they would give you jobs even if it's just small jobs, and then they would trust you know they would give the opportunity to someone who's just starting out, uh, as you know. But back in Toronto, it's like totally different things. So it's like the industry already have certain people's you know stay there and then it's so hard for you to break in so I think that's coming to New York is probably one of the you know jumping point for me and then after I come to New York I think like I said like just keep on you know reaching out and then doing more tasks and creatives you just never know like I said like some of the clients booked me because my one of my task images so you just never know and um, uh, to answer your second question, like how to get you know international publication, so it's really simple actually. They they didn't come for me, of course, but I reached out. So I think you have to be smart about like who are you reaching out first. You need to know, say, if you want to do a beauty story, you definitely don't want to reach out to a fashion editor, right? So you need to reach out to like a beauty director or someone who's in charge of the beauty department. So I think it's important for you to really like do your homework and then to really know like who are you contacting. And then I think we're at a really great era, like you know, the social media and everything. So it's easier to find information everywhere. So just yeah, reaching out and then um, show your work to them and then keep you know improving your work and then eventually I think if they like your work they definitely give you opportunity to you know work with them and the uh, third question is agency right um, I'm like right now I, I don't have a rep so I freelancing right now I think I'm doing well on my own at the moment I'm not really in a rush to join any agency I found maybe like if you're just starting out and then there's an agency wanted to represent you, I think it can be a good thing. So they might give you like, you know, 
open your doors to new clients and then help you grow. But I think it's different for everyone. I think for me, when I just started, because I have my you know girlfriend and we work together, so she's kind of like my agent in a sense. So I don't really need someone else to kind of manage my career. So that's why I didn't really think about you know joining an agency or not. But I did have some meetings with agencies before for sure. And then I think it's so important that you find an agency that is you know you guys are on the same page, and then they're gonna promote you in the way that you want you know you want it to be. So. For me, I think uh, maybe maybe later on I might want to join an agency only because you know there are some clients that you can you just never can reach by yourself. So you know like you know big clients only reach out to agencies or advertising companies. So it's really hard for you to you know get those clients. I think that's probably one of the reasons I will join an agency. And uh, for me right now, I think my top. You know, dream agency will be Streeters because I like how they are not, you know, so commercial. And then I, because I really do love, you know, doing editorial work. So I think they might be a good fit for me. Yeah, I hope Streeters. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm a current student at the program. Okay. Um, it's like really nice to see you here because we actually talk about you and your work a lot <laughs> <laughs> during <laughs> during like really? some free time. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So, and before coming to program, like I imagined, like several possibilities of myself, like SVA. It's such mm -hmm. a great school. Yes. I'll be end up in a such like a glamorous like fashion photographer. That's one of my like what that that's what I imagined before. So one day I um I I talk to my classmates Tenny. I'll be like Tenny, let's do a fashion shoot. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be great. <laughs> and then. I brought in some makeup in the studio, set up the light. Yeah. But then the moment <coughs> when I pressed the camera, I realized I'm taking the photographs that on the Instagram in a style which people liked a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, like the moment you take the photograph, it might be the photograph people tend to, like, you tend okay. to get a lot of likes. Yeah. But yourself looking at it just don't really show any of like, a sense of like I guess myself in it so I'm curious about like as a very successful uh, photographer what's your take on that um, and what do you, because you have a fine art background, background as yes. well um, and also shooting fashion it's like a combination of so many things like mm -hmm. collaboration like solving problems yes. like in the end of the day like how much percent of that I love the work that I did. It has my voice. Like, how much of that is important to you? Um, I think when I'm doing like editorial works, I think um, I think for editorial work, I like I think I feel like for editorial work, it's kind of like you know making artwork in a sense. You are really involved in the whole process. You are developing a concept together or like refine the concept together, I should say. Yeah, because normally, you know, magazine has the concept, but I think just, you know, the whole process of, you know, creating a story is kind of like making art. So in a sense to me, I'm still like making art. So, but when I'm doing like, you know, maybe commercial works, I'm not in control. So I might feel less, you know, proud of the work I've done, if that makes sense. And then I guess, uh, like you said, like sometimes when you press the shutter, you automatically think, "Oh, this is something that you know people might like on Instagram or on social media." I had the same problem before, so I guess you just like back in Toronto. I know, like you know, when you are doing beauties, they have certain you know preference or taste on you know a specific style you know they like. So I just kind of mimic that kind of style in the beginning, and then like I said. And just you know, keep on trying new things and then experiment more. So I think the more you try, and then your style kind of evolved in those sense. So you will eventually kind of find your own voice in your own work. Does that make any sense? <laughs> Thank you. Hi. So when you're reaching out, yes. do you feel like it sounds like some of it was on social media yes. on Instagram? Do you feel as though when you reach out, you can just let that person um, look back at your profile and see a lot of your work mm -hmm. or 
yeah, that's, do you include yeah. work when you reach out if it's through a okay. different medium? And then for like these test yes. shoots, how are they seeing mm -hmm. that work? And so of what's that? that's a good question. Yeah. So I think right now, like people rarely go to my website to look mm -hmm. at my work anymore. So I kind of use social media as my website. So um, I would suggest you like for me myself, I only have I have account where I only post my, you know, editorial work or a task I did. So when people go to my profile, they see automatically see all the work I done. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, a, a marketing tools. And then if you want, you can have another account for your personal st things like, you know, the things you eat, the, you know, the stuff you do. So, and actually people kind of do like to see like, you know, your personal life as well. So they kind of need to know, oh, is this person is, you know, nice or what he's, what he like and stuff like that. So I think it's important for you, you know, to really build your social media to a certain point. And then uh, when I'm reaching out uh, on Instagram, right? So people just, you know, click back to my account and see all my works. So that's how, you know, um, I would reach out, yeah. Uh, I just want to know, uh, you're talking about you've been shooting in like a small motel like mm -hmm. in uh, Long Island City, yeah. Tatami. I, I know that those issues because I check out your works yeah. a lot. But I realized the like for example for the Tatami one, it's also like a restaurant or something. So where, uh, like how can you find those interesting places to shoot? I mean um, besides peer space, of course we can like rent for a couple hours to yeah. shoot. Like, I mean, after I see your work, I put those plays into my own like okay. yeah, uh, so album, so I can shoot there. But how do you usually <laughs> <laughs> find those amazing places for photo shoots? So, uh, like you Thank see you. the motel one, right? Because um, that motel, it's called Silver Sand. You probably see like a lot of people goes there to shoot. So uh, it's kind of you know obvious that I shoot there too because you know a lot of my friend recommended there. So it's not too far, it's like, you know, two hour drive, so it's easier for you to manage. And then for the hotel, sh you know, the Japanese things, um, the location was actually found by the fashion editor from the magazine. So he had the connection with the hotel. And then so they, you know, uh, they kind of reach out to the hotel and then say, oh, hey, we want to do this. And then maybe we can use their, you know, your, tatami suite to shoot so uh, for me myself normally I would just go on to like the website like you said like peer space or splicer to you know look for you know places for my next project and then sometimes I just you know look through Instagram as well and then see you know the the geographic tag and then see where the location is and then just trying to figure out like uh, you know where did they shoot this or just by simply reaching out to you know uh, photographers, other photographers, or stylists, or whoever, you know, to, uh, you know, that's pretty much how I find location in this way. Or, oh yeah, another thing. So you can, you can hire a location scouter for you as well, actually. And so you just need to pay them and then give them like a really specific like description of the place you want to shoot, and then they will help you to find the, you know, the right location. So that could be a good way. Uh, could you pull up your co your cosmetic advertising piece? You had a double yes. page spread, and that's it. Like this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously you you were given a layout to shoot from this. No. Yes, oh. oftentimes yes. I know, like this is for their website. This is for banner. This is for like you know the P page or for Sephora or something like that. Yes, I do. So you had, uh, did you have agency people with you in the studio while you were shooting this? Like the people from the company. Yeah. Yes. The clients always you always be there, yeah. Well, the the, the uh, retouching artists a must retouching it, artist? must enjoy working with you because of your lighting. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious. Did did you, you said you like to re you love retouching? Yes. Not like. <laughs> did you did you retouch this or did you just turn it over to them? Um, for me, like most of the commercial work you're seeing, I send it out to a retoucher. So because like the amount of work you have to do for a commercial job is just crazy. Sometimes you need to go through like 10 rounds of retouching just to make the client happy. So they might have some ridiculous, you know, 
requirement for you. So I normally for you know commercial jobs, I would you know source out for to a retoucher. Well, I just want to say we are going to have students watch your presentation in the first week of school <laughs> instead of the last week. I mean, it was so comprehensive. You addressed so much. I mean, it was like a, a semester class in an hour. <laughs> no, it was fabulous. I'm like raving. It was great. Okay, I don't have a question. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if uh, sometimes things get lost in translation when you uh, work with somebody, let's say, like somebody mentioned Kazakhstan or uh, some r remote location out there, um, and they have expectations about what you can do for them in New York. Mm. Are, are those expectations sometimes unrealistic, and how do you negotiate that? Um, um, I think sometimes, yes, and they might have a ridiculous, you know, request, but you just need to, you know, sometimes tell them, you know, straight, straight on, like, I can't do this, it's not possible here in New York, so you need to kind of compromise, you know, or find a balance with them when you are doing, you know, those kind of jobs. So, yeah, but I, for me, normally, I don't find them, like, giving really just, you know, outrageous, you know, request. So it's always really simple, just giving you a theme and then really just trusting you and then to produce a great shoot. Also, I think um, when you are shooting, you know, more and more for them, they started to, you know, the relationship just started to, to build and then they kind of more trust you to do what you want to do. So, yeah, things got easier if you just keep shooting for them. Yeah. And uh, does a crew sometimes come for the shoot from there, let's say, uh a fashion um, editor or uh, a writer is that S sometimes like you know uh, the magazine people will come to New York during you know fashion week so that's when they the the actual people will come here and then maybe do a set up a shoot f with you so but most of the time like yeah they just you know control things remotely <laughs> all right well I just want to say you know in in addition to what Katrine said um, that it, it was such a candid and, and generous talk, and uh, we really appreciate you, and Thank you. we're so happy you were here tonight with, uh, with this presentation. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. I hope that really helps.